Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Frank Farrow, who's going to talk today about GDDR6 applications. So Frank, GDDR6 was originally developed for graphics applications, but it's starting to be used in other places. Why is that happening? So it's happening because the, the number of applications just requiring memory bandwidth is um, just continuing to grow. The, the different applications around AI in the data center, uh, certainly graphics continues to be an important application. We're looking at uh, automotive and networking. These are all demanding more memory bandwidth. And so looking at the solutions like GDDR is a great option because it, it kind of falls in a nice place. It's a good trade-off between the cost and the performance that you can get in a, in a memory system. It's not the only choice out there though, right? There are some other options as well. Absolutely. Uh, HBM, certainly for very, very high bandwidth, very good power efficiency, is a great solution. Uh, DDR, of course, is always going to be there, uh, along with the embedded uh, memory system. So you have, you know, embedded memory gives you, obviously, the very, very low latency, good performance, but it's expensive to put on chip. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So, Frank, what are we looking at here? So we're looking at the trade-off that customers have to make when choosing a memory system. So there's several different dynamics working kind of sometimes against each other, sometimes together. I've drawn out in uh, circles here the different uh, trade-offs that have to be made. So clearly uh, customers are looking at uh, bandwidth and performance. That's a, a key metric. At the same time, there's a cost factor. Uh, also power has become very, very important regardless of the application. A lot of the applications we think power is just mobile, but now power is being considered in every application, and then capacity, how much storage can I get out of the system? And so these kind of uh, uh, boxes or trade-offs are, are working either against each other or together, and we have to figure out what the best solution is. How much of this goes on-chip versus off-chip? Is this all off-chip? That's a good question, because clearly on-chip memory is going to give you the most efficiency in terms of it's going to be very low power because of CPU can access things very quickly, you're going to have very low latency, but it's expensive. Putting, putting on-chip SRAM is, uh, is going to drive your cost up. So as you look at the, the semiconductor curve, you know, that's, it, you, know it's, it, you hit the knee of that cost and you can't really add more memory. So now you've got to go off-chip. So trading off uh, the system architecture between on-chip and off-chip is very critical in the decision on which memory system to choose. And it's also critical when you start getting into things like AI chips, right? Because these, these chips tend to be very large. You've got a lot of processing going on on there. You've got uh, lots of SRAM scattered around. And now you have to move this data back and forth off chip very quickly. That's right. So AI covers a very broad range of applications. And we can talk about those in a minute. So for example, in training applications, you're going to have very large data sets. And so in those cases, you're going to need uh, a large amount of off chip memory uh, probably balanced with some on-chip memory. In the case of AI inference, again, you're going to be trying to look at, you know, how can I balance those, those trade-offs? You're going to need a little less off-chip memory, but again, you have to look at the, the different um, data sets and, and algorithms that are used to, um, to uh, kind of compute what you're looking at in these cases, right, or to decide what, the, what that image is. And it's something like networking, your key thing there is bandwidth back and forth, right? That's right. So networking you know, cards, you're, you've, got, you've got different uh, applications like packet buffering where you need very high bandwidth, you know, maybe moderate density on there. Where does graphics fit into this? So graphics, especially when we're talking about GDDR, continues to drive that application. Graphics needs the highest performance you can get. So if I look at um, a graphics card today, you can get up to almost a terabyte of processing on the very high-end graphics cards all the way down to some of the more consumer graphics cards where you're getting, you know, several hundred uh, gigabytes of processing. And your last variable there is power. How does that play into this? So power is everything these days. Even clearly a lot of talk has been in the power that can being consumed in the data center. So you think, you know, you've, you've got to figure out a way to keep the, the power, even a little bit of power savings in the data center is critical. Uh, graphics cards as well <clears throat> are looking for much lower power consumption. Again, they're always worried about heat. Uh, and, and the balance of heat and performance. GDDR6 is not static either, right? Because now you've got different versions of this coming out? That's right. So, you know, started with, with uh, GDDR5, which 
was a, you know, a very good high performance memory again, mostly targeted at graphics. Now GDDR6 is starting, you're seeing cards in the market at 10 gigabits per second, uh, cards coming out even up, at, up into the 16 gigabit range on the graphics side. And even there's been announcements uh, of up to 18 gigabits uh, DRAM. So yeah, there's a, again, there's a push on, on GDDR to continue to go as fast as you can, get as much bandwidth as you can out of the systems. How does this compare to other types of memory in terms of uh, you're using this on something connected to a battery as opposed to a plug? So again, as I mentioned, power is, is really critical, right? And uh, I think the, the, the heat management of the system is, is very important. You see a lot of these graphics cards, you know, actually have active cooling systems on them. And anything you can do to reduce the power reduces the cost of the cooling that's required on these cards. So let's drill down into some of the applications here. What are the performance metrics for each one of these? Sure. As I mentioned, you know, graphics is, is certainly at the highest end. So you, you're looking at high-end graphics cards, you know, in the, you know, 900, you know, gigabyte uh, range, gig, gigabytes per second range. And you got, you know, cards that are in three, you know, in the 320, you know, to 500. And so uh, these are all gigabytes. And so if you look at at you know what are the solutions that I can get here? As you mentioned, uh, you know you have you have GDDR5, you know going to now GDDR6, and so even in these highest end applications now you have you know HBM. So you can see even within the graphics segments you've got a range of, of applications you can cover from kind of lower end consumer applications still being well covered by GDDR5, GDDR6, and then for the very high end, uh, high bandwidth memories being used for this. What happens on networking? Where do you see that? Yes, yeah, so again, as I, I mentioned, you know, networking, again, looking for very high throughput. So a lot of these we're seeing uh, HBM, you know, in the, you know, again, the kind of the one, you know, terabit, uh, terabyte range, excuse me, uh, bytes per second. So again, HBM is, is a very good solution uh, for, for the networking cards. Automotive is its own world too because DRAM doesn't function very well in heat, but the, you think about what goes on in a car, it can be a very harsh environment, both heat and cold. That, that's right, so it, it really stresses the DRAM and the s solutions today have to be you know, automotive grade qualified. And that, that might mean a little bit, uh, maybe a pullback in a, uh, a performance speed grade, and if you look at the requirements around automotive today, so you're doing a lot, you're doing AI in these ADAS systems. Uh, you have to, for example, if I'm going to perceive an image, if I want to see something, the car has to perceive an image. But you could be processing again up to 700, you know, gigabytes per second. That's a, that's a lot of processing that's going to be needed. Now, HBM sounds like a good solution there, but because of the two and a half D structure, because of the automotive qual. Uh, it's kind of difficult to get into that application. So again, GDDR6, we're seeing as a, as a great solution there. And, you know, you're, you're talking about GDDR6 systems that right now today, you know, running at 16, you know, gig, gigabits per second. And so you can kind of configure those to, to support these type of applications. Again, very challenging. How about IoT? I mean, they think about an IoT device is typically uh, sensor connected to the internet somehow, but there is some memory that's coming into some of these systems too, right? Yeah, in the case of IoT, probably uh, HBM and GDDR are still a, a bit uh, away from hitting those kinds. Of, you know, right now it's all about power. So if you look at you know IoT, we're kind of in this kind of zone here, right, with very low cost very low power. So certainly LPDDR is being used in, in IoT. You, you, you clearly want to get as much on-chip memory as possible in those applications to run as long as you can and at the lowest cost. So again, you've got to look at that semiconductor trade-off of how much on-chip memory can I put versus off-chip memory and, and stay in a very, very low cost, very low power. Some of these devices have to be battery operated to even stay on for a very long time. We've talked a lot about HBM versus GDDR6. How about GDDR6 versus the LPDDR? Again, if, if we look at some of the specific numbers, LPDDR today, the LPDDR4X is about 4.2 gigs. So if I do, you know, just write it out here, LP4 is you know 4.2 GBPS. And 
And so that's you know 4.2 gig per pin, you know, times 30, 32 bits on those. You know, GDDR6 is, as I mentioned, 16 gig bits per second times 32 pins. 32 bits, excuse me. Yeah. You can see, you know, four times faster GDDR6 in terms of the overall bandwidth performance. Does it do better uh, under certain conditions than GDDR6? Is there anything about the environment that would change that? Well, LP, LP4 clearly was de, uh, designed for the mobile market. It, the, the type of applications it originally was designed for to go in a pop package, meaning you can kind of stack the DRAM right on top of the um, processor with very short, with very short connections, either um, kind of wire bonded together. So it gives you a very good, you know, from a signal integrity standpoint, you can run pretty fast uh, and keep uh, the power very low, and there's also a lot of custom modes built on LP4. GDDR6, again, we talked about was built for graphics, so it's just, it's designed for speed and uh, to go as fast as it can. It's not necessarily in its current form, you know, very concerned about power. I think going forward, though, we're seeing GDDR6 now also starting to look at power, and, start, and you'll see more modes on GDDR6 that are trying to shut the power down when uh, there's no activity. One of the hot areas in the market these days is AI, of course, both on the training and the inferencing side. And there seems to be a lot of attention because AI is going into almost everything that we can think about. Right. What happens on the memory there? What's the choice and why? So again, you've got multiple uh, applications for AI, as you mentioned, is going in everything. If you look at AI uh, training applications, so if I do AI you know, training, then you've got very, very high bandwidth requirements. And so again, this is going to be kind of greater than one terabyte of performance you're going to need, bytes per second. And so, and again, this is a very good system you know, for HBM, as we talked about. So HBM2, and now you know, HBM2E, is going to give you up to 3.2 gigabits per second times 1024 bits. So you can see you have quite a bit of performance available with HBM. So this is very good for training applications. As new versions of GDDR6 come out, will they start competing with HBM or will HBM now move uh, as well? So I think there's a home for both HBM and GDDR6. So I'm going to erase this and we'll, do, um, we'll look at AI inference. So if I look at AI inference now, you, you're looking at a data sets that are, are a bit more, you, you don't need quite the terabits, so somewhere in the range of, let's say, 320 to 500 um, gigabit, gigabytes, okay? And so now you're in the range of GDDR. The other, the other challenge that designers have when you're doing AI inference is that you've got, you're under much tighter cost constraints. So they may not have the luxury of uh, paying for an HBM, a two and a half D system. So we're seeing GDDR6 is becoming uh, very popular um, for, you know, at 16 gig or as fast as it can go for AI inference. And then finally, you have AI kind of at the edge. And in those systems, you're, you're looking at, you know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 uh, gigabytes per second. And in that case, you know, one GDDR can, can solve that problem, or as you mentioned, maybe even a, an LPDDR4 potentially could solve that problem. And when we talk about the edge, just to be clear, this is pretty much anything between the endpoint, which has not, no memory on it, and no processing, all the way up to the cloud, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's right. So, Frank, what does a real GDDR6 system actually look like? So let's take a look. So I've drawn here a uh, GDDR6 system. This is, uh, shows, shows multiple GDDRs on, uh, working in conjunction with the CPU. And so you can see on, on this side, we've got four GDDR6s, and we've got four GDDR6 on this side of the, the system. So this is, this is be, be a great um, solution for either a networking application or even potentially you know, an AI um, inference application. As a matter of fact, one of our, our customers recently announced a system that looks just, just like this. And so that's uh, uh, showing how you can get um, multiple types of applications with the GDDR. 
So if I look at some of the performance metrics around this, you've got, um, these are all GDDR6 DRAMs, so this is G6 uh, DRAMs. And the performance of these are, at, as I mentioned earlier, are at 16 gigabits per second, okay? So now we have a, a, a fairly uh, high performance system so if you if you do the if you do the math on this right now we're we're running at five to twelve gigabytes per second with this particular configuration of GDR. So again, you've got sixteen gigabits per second. Uh, each of these are thirty two bits. Check their thirty two bits uh, channels. You know, multiply by sixteen and then multiply by eight, and so that gives you the performance. So again, very high performance system. Uh, with these HGDRs. As you move up in speed from 16 to 18 to 20 and 24 gigabits per second, what has to change on this? Clearly, as, as the speed goes up, the, although this is, a, this is built on a, a more traditional PCB, so you've got a, a CPU down, you've got D, DRAM down on a PCB, you've got to definitely worry about the signal integrity challenges around running these traces at you know, 16 or 18 gigabits per second. So very careful um, uh, design has to be done in terms of a couple different areas. You're uh, having all these signals, you're going to have to worry about things like crosstalk, for example. You're going to have to worry about insertion loss. You're going to have to worry about reflections. And so part of the uh, system challenge is that, you know, how do I design this to minimize those effects? And this also gets worse as the heat goes up too, right? So the all these are, are magnified as, as you start adding in other elements as well. Yeah, if you look at the uh, physical environment, then clearly these are generating quite a bit of heat. As, as we talked about earlier, if you're in an automotive type environment, what you might have to do then to manage heat is to maybe bring these bring this down to, you know, there's multiple sc speed grades on GDDR6 and you can actually run it, you know, at 14 or even you know, 12 uh, gigabits per second. And that certainly helps the, you know, the, the power is clearly a function of how fast you're going to run this. And also the noise coming off your CPU is going to get uh, more intense as you go from 12, 10 to 7, 5 nanometers too, right? Because your dielectrics are thinner. Exactly. As, that's right. So as the frequency goes up, clearly the resistive effects of the dielectric is, is one of the uh, biggest impacts that we're going to have to worry about as we're designing the system. And the, there's, there's ways certainly to mitigate um, those effects. There's a, there you can do that, uh, you can do that mitigation through circuitry in the, in the physical layer. So each of these um, GDR6s are connected to a PHI. And so you can, you can do uh, different types of techniques inside the PHI. However, we, what we found though is the, the most effective way to deal with these effects is through the physical design environment. Through your packaging and through your PCB is going to be the most cost-effective way to deal with that and, to, and, and get, getting you the best performance. You mentioned crosstalk. Crosstalk typically has not been an issue until we started getting down into the advanced nodes. You think about uh, crosstalk, a lot of that happened in uh, very noisy digital analog type of, of mixed signal type of applications, but it's starting to show up in the digital side now as well too, right? How do you manage that particularly in this type of system? And so you're running at very high frequencies, and that's where the crosstalk starts to be a challenge. So there's a couple ways to mitigate the effects. If you, if you really have to look at these different signals, that, uh, traces that are running very close to each other, and you're going to have uh, effects from you know, uh, aggressors uh, that are kind of influencing what's happening on the, the traces nearby. So a couple ways we mitigate that is certainly by the, the PCB materials, you know, using uh, strip line routing, for example could help. Also the type of packaging you use. The BGA placement is very critical, where you place these BGAs and how you route those signals out. And this is a, an area, you know, Rambus's uh, expertise have done, done a lot of work and a lot of uh, papers on, on how to mitigate these effects of, of crosstalk. Frank Farrell, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.